All right, good evening, everybody. Calling to order our city council study session, Tuesday, May 14th. I will have our city clerk start with our roll call. Mayor Kaylee Clark. Here. Deputy Mayor Karen Howe. Here. Council member Amy Lamb. Here. Council member Pamela Stewart. Council member Kent Treen. Council member Sid Gupta. Here. Council member Oshin O'Farrell. Here. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, I know Council Member Treen is running late. He'll be here in a couple minutes. And Council Member O'Farrell? Yeah, I'd like to make a motion to excuse Council Member Stewart from tonight's meeting. Second. All right, moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, six zero. I will lead us in the pledge. Council Member O'Farrell, do you mind doing the land acknowledgement? I would be happy to. We acknowledge that we are on the indigenous land of the, Co the Coast Salish peoples who have reserved treaty rights to this land, specifically the Snoqualmie Indian tribe. We thank these caretakers for this land who have lived and continue to live here since time immemorial. Great, thank you. Uh, next up, I will entertain a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. second. All right. Moved and seconded. Any questions or comments? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, 6-0, we are good there. And next up we have a proclamation starting with International Compost Awareness Week with uh, Councilmember Lamb. We're making a proclamation for International Compost Awareness Week, May 5th through the 11th, 2024. Whereas the Compost Research and Education Foundation, along with multiple countries, have declared the first week of May to be the annual International Compost Awareness Week. And whereas composting is a way of returning organic resources to the soil, and conserving water during extreme, extreme drought or flooding conditions, reducing water consumption and non-point pollution, and a proven method of decreasing the dependence of chemi on, chem on chemical fertilizers and decreasing erosion. And whereas composting is an effective form of waste reduction, reuse and recycling, and since organic materials make up about 30% of materials going to landfills, composting is becoming one of the primary methods communities use to reach waste diversion goals. And whereas materials such as yard trimmings, vegetable cuttings, biosolids, food scraps, manures, and hay shavings have all been composted and converted into beneficial product known as compost. And whereas communities through their local governments Highway Department, soil, soil Conservation Service, and Extension Offices, and Public Works Professionals can have a significant impact on clean water, soil, climate change, and landfill diversion by using compost for public works projects. And whereas International Compost Awareness Week is a publicity and educational initiative to showcase compost production and demonstrate compost use, and whereas composting creates green jobs and infrastructure for cities and states that implement composting programs, and whereas the theme, this year's theme is compost, nature's climate champion, and the 2024 theme highlights the role compost plays in fighting climate change, including by decreasing methane, helping with climate change mitigation, reducing fertilizer inputs, and increasing resilience. And using compost creates healthier soil and helps the environment. Now therefore, be it resolved that the mayor, Kaylee Clark, on behalf of the Sammamish City Council, in recognition of the efforts of the Compost Research and Education Foundation, extension agents, soil conservation stewards, household householders, landscapers, farmers, recyclers, public workers, composters, gardeners, and plant growers worldwide do hereby proclaim the week of May 5th through the 11th, 2024 as International Compost Awareness Week. Awesome, thank you so much. All right, next up we have our National Safe Boating and Paddling Week. <clears throat> May 18th, 20, uh, May 18th through the 24th, 2024. 
Uh, whereas the city of Sammamish is bounded by miles of Lake Sammamish shoreline and encompasses lakes and waterways, and Sammamish residents of all ages engage in recreational boating and paddling, and with the surge of Americans engaging in paddling activities since 2020, many without training, paddling fatalities now constitute more than 25% of all boating fatalities nationwide. And the vast majority of serious boating and paddling accidents are caused by a lack of training, human error, or poor judgment and a significant number of boaters whose lives, who lose their lives by drowning each year <clears throat> would be alive today if they had worn a life jacket. And the mission of the United States Coast Guard Auxiliary Division Two is to promote and improve recreational boating safety by teaching boating safety courses and conducting vessel safety checks. Now, therefore, I, Kaylee Clark, Mayor of Sammamish, Washington, do hereby proclaim this week to be Sammamish Safe Boating and Paddling Week and encourage all Sammamish residents to dedicate themselves to learning about and practicing safe boating, including wearing life jackets. I'll now have uh, Commander Emeritus uh, Blackstock, if you'd like to say a few words, and then we'll get a photo. Thank you for being here. If you, if you press the button at the base of that, and uh, it'll, there should be a green there button. There we go. Coming. There we go. Yeah, the green button works wonderfully. <laughs> <laughs> Well, good evening. My name is Larry Blackstock. I'm going to be very short, uh, but I'm really happy that you are here today. The Coast Guard Auxiliary is, is uh, a wonderful place to, uh, where we can bring ourselves together and where we can work together in one common uh, place in, in many different places, but particularly uh, here in the city of Sammamish, that we have the sea fair that is so close to us. and has things coming through here in that area, but especially when we get into our own boating, uh, there's a lot of things that happen, and uh, there's some concern from for, for many times. But as we begin to move towards the summer months, we've had wonderful weather. It's been uh, maybe up to 80 degrees or 70 degrees. It sounds great, but then under the water, Shortly below the water, it's been 51 degrees, and it'll be 52 or 50 degrees, or 52 degrees some of the times, but it's always best to have your jacket. You have to have a life jacket because when you jump in the water and it's cold, any one of us as a human will go, <gasps> and that's where the water goes in. And so we just have to have people uh, enjoying the, the time that we have to uh, the springtime, the summertime. Uh, we want you to uh, have your friends know about it, have them have a jacket, your friends, and uh, be happy and be safe during this season so everybody can have a wonderful time and stay safe. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. And if you'll both come up and we can get a photo, that'd be great. All right, thank you both again. All right, we have our first presentation of the evening is the Fleet Electrification Study Update. Uh, so, Rose. Uh, 
Good evening, council members. My name is Rose Weicker, and I am the sustainability coordinator here in the city. For those who do not know me, um, I am serving as project manager for our fleet electrification study handled by consultant makers. Tonight is the first of two presentations to council um, for the findings of this study. With me tonight, there's Anjali Meyer, the Director of Parks and Recreation, as well as John Arnold, the Facilities and Fleet Superintendent. Tonight, Rish Ukil from Makers is gonna be taking it away. Thanks so much. All right, can you all hear me? Good evening, everybody. Um, so I'm happy to present the fleet electrification analysis. This is, as Rose mentioned, the first of the two study sessions. Um, if you don't mind, going to the next slide, please. So today's um, agenda is to go over, to review progress of the study so far. So we've been working on this study for about um, six months and to confirm the draft electrification approach. Um, so what we want to go over today is the relevant Sammamish targets um, and the electrification context. Taking a little bit, at, taking a little look at your um, vehicles, small tools, charging, and backup power needs, and then walk you through the electrification approach um, and the cost to reduce emissions. Then the focus of the, the next study session would be to look at the investment strategy and then uh, review electric vehicle adoption trends and public charging. Next slide, please. You might be familiar with most of the definitions, you've probably seen it before, uh, but I still wanted to go over some of the definitions or acronyms that uh, will be used in this presentation. Um, starting off with vehicle classes. So vehicle class is defined by um, how much a vehicle is carrying or towing or the number of axles. Uh, in short, they can be divided into three groups, light duty, medium duty, and heavy duty, or in shorts, LD, MD, or HD. Light duty means it's passenger cars and small off-road vehicles. Uh, medium duty means mid-sized trucks and vans. Heavy duty are the dump trucks and large service trucks that you see around town. Um, they're also divided by engine type. ICE, are, which is internal combustion engine. In simple terms, they are the conventional fossil fuel vehicles. EV, or electric vehicle. Um, AFV, or alternative fuel vehicle. Uh, they make up different categories. Um, the most commonly used are that in this presentation are HEV, or hybrids. Um, and then plug-in hybrid electric vehicle or PHEV. Another term that you might not be very familiar with is R99 fuel. Um, this is a renewable diesel made from sustainably sourced renewable materials uh, from feedstocks and um, animal fats and other um, renewable sources. It can be used as a drop-in replacement for many of your um, fleet. Uh, it is a replacement for petroleum-based diesel fuel, and it also functions identically to fossil fuel. So it's a good replacement because it reduces emissions by almost 66%. The last acronym over there is, uh, you're probably familiar with this one, MTCO2E. Um, it means metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, which is the, the commonly used as a unit of measurement for greenhouse gas emissions. Next slide. All right, so the first section talks about electrification context and the market data. So you might be familiar with the, the graphic that you see on the right, that is your 2019 community emissions from your climate action plan that was adopted late last year. Um, it divides up the emissions by three categories, electricity, natural gas, and transportation. So we are focused in this study on the smallest wedge, which is transportation. And the two relevant targets that this study is uh, addressing is reducing greenhouse gas emissions from your 2019 levels per your climate action plans, which is by 50% by 2030 and 96% by 2050. The other one that we're looking at was 20% EV adoption by 2030, which is uh, part of the K4C climate collaboration uh, commitment that the city of Sammamish has made. Next one, please. All right, um, so this slide talks about uh, revolving, uh, evolving industry. As you know, electric vehicles, it's a rapidly evolving industry. Um, technological changes are happening every single day. Um, the supply chain is having a hard time keeping track of things. Uh, what we can say for certain is that um, electrification cannot happen overnight for your fleet. But what we can say based on available information, um, this in today's date is that most light duty and medium duty vehicles are available for purchase by 2025. 
but actual deployment might be delayed. It could be impacted by procurement issues that many um, manufacturers are having today. What we hope is they will be more widely available for purchase by 2027. On the heavy duty and emergency response fleet, the level of service today um, does not allow for electrification. The technology isn't developed um, as much as you would want. So on the heavy duty, the technology is developed. In some cases, uh, it is being trialed in other parts of the world, but they are not widely available in North America today. The current technology, it will also likely not meet your operation requirements. The industry is not mature enough for that. However, the good news is drop-in fill replacements like R99 fill, they are becoming more widely available for um, cities like Sammamish to use. We expect um, EVs on the heavy duty site to be more widely available in 2029. Okay, next slide, please. As part of the study, we also looked at the regional context. What are your peers around this region doing? So we looked at fleet electrification studies for many agencies, uh, but we also interviewed uh, your interviewed city staff at Redmond and Essequoia, your immediate neighbors. But we found that electric vehicles are making up about 5% of your eligible fleet today across the board. They're commonly being used by inspectors, our motor pool vehicles, and most are pretty satisfied with the performance so far. You might see a lot more EVs in other jurisdictions elsewhere, but you should take into consideration the fact that they have a much larger fleet size. The percentage of EVs that you have today, it's about three num in raw numbers, but the percentage of EVs that you have in Sammamish, it is very comparable to other agencies with a much larger fleet size. So you're making good progress so far. Everybody's saying supply chain issues are impacting their procurement. They're having a hard time getting the EVs um, on their, um, buying the EVs and getting them to use it. R99 fuel, however, is becoming very common. Most agencies are having, uh, either are considering switching or have already switched to R99 fuel for their diesel vehicles to reduce emissions. In order to accommodate EVs, there is also significant time and planning it required to install the infrastructure, and there's also significant cost involved in installing that infrastructure on your own site. So that is something that everybody is facing today. Finally, in order to reduce uh, some of your um, short-term costs, many policy changes are being reviewed by different agencies uh, in order to meet the level of service requirement, but also to fit within existing budgets, so such as leasing vehicles, um, adopting or modifying green fleet policies, but also pursuing utility incentives, and some of that we'll go into a little bit detail later in the presentation. All right, this next section talks about the assessment of your tools, um, small tools, and your fleet. So fleet, by that we mean um, vehicles, off-road equipment, motors, trailers, arrow and message boards, and truck attachments. And then on the small tools, these are blowers, chainsaws, trimmers, generators. Quick overview of what we, the different facilities that we looked at for the study, City Hall, MOC were the two major sites, but at the planning level, we also looked at Beaver Lake Shop and the recently purchased South Yard. Next slide, please. This slide talks a little bit about how your fleet and small tools are distributed. So the, the donut on the right talks about um, you have 165 fleet, majority of them at MOC, a little bit at this facility at City Hall. You have a lot more fleet at offsite parking and storage areas. The fleet was considered as part of the electrification study, but infrastructure at that site was not evaluated as part of this study. On the small tools, about the same numbers, most at MOC and a little bit at Beaver Lake, and the rest at Beaver Lake Shop. Next slide, please. This one talks about the same information, it talks about type. Um, so the grays indicate um, attachment boards and trailers. The, the green that you see, those are all vehicles, again, distributed by um, the different duties, so light, medium, and heavy. The orange are off-road equipment, and then the purple are motors. And then on the small tools, you can see you have a lot, uh, lot you have a quite a bit of blowers, chain, cutoff saws, and trimmers. So that's the different component of the fleet. As you can see on the fleet side, a lot of your vehicles are light duty, whether it's off-road or vehicles. So that becomes the, the major vehicle that you have today. Now, we looked at electrification eligibility, like what's eligible and what's and what is contributing towards your emissions, thinking about the baseline 2019 emissions. So the grades that you see, the attachment boards and trailers, it's, it's worth noting that they are non-motorized fleet. They do not have any motor, they do not emit anything and not eligible for electrification. 
The next one that you see going clockwise are vehicles. Uh, they are divided into critical and non-critical. Uh, those are the vehicles that are contributing towards your K4C commitment of 20% uh, EV by 2030. So you are at 3% today, you made some progress. Then the next two are the ones in blue, uh, the dark and the light blue, they are off-road equipment. Again, they show you, you can see there how many are critical and how many are non-critical. Um, along with the vehicles, the critical response equipment, you have about 20 of them, they are eligible for electrification, but today's technology unfortunately um, cannot meet your operational needs um, for electrification. And then finally, motors and small tools. Um, electrification of small tools and motors, it's possible. There are some reliable options, but electrifying them might impact your level of service that you want. Finally, we also looked at emissions. Um, 237 metric tons of emissions were produced by cities fleet in 2019. So that is the baseline number that we are working from. And you can see from the graph, which is um, distribution of emissions by vehicle, off-road equipment, and also by the duty type. And you can see the most of the emissions for, from vehicles, light and heavy duty. It does exclude uh, emissions from contracted fleet. It does exclude um, emissions from motors and small tools uh, because of insufficient data. Finally, the recommended approach, which is the, the yellow bars, as you can see, they reduce 50% emissions from 2030. So we'll get into emissions in the next few slides, but just to give you a perspective of where you started in 2019 and implementing the draft electrification approach can meet your near-term goals of 50% reduction. And it's no surprise that much of the reduction is on the light duty vehicle and off-road because that is the market that is most mature today. So this section talks about electrification approach. Um, before we go through the electrification approach, some considerations of the strategy, and we should know that this is uh, it's intended to be a roadmap. And as you know, the technology will change. What this allows you is to modify your strategy as things evolve in the industry, but also as funding opportunities evolve and as your budget capacity um, evolves throughout the, the next few years. The strategy is divided into two parts, uh, fleet replacement and charging. For the fleet, uh, a few considerations, they are modeled on current fleet and operational requirements. Uh, critical response vehicles and HD fleet that are not ready to electrify, not ready to be replaced uh, in order to meet your level of service requirements, they should transition to um, R99 hybrid or plug-in hybrid. It does mean you, can, you rely a little bit on gasoline still because of the hybrid and plug-in hybrid. Um, and also some medium duty fleet needs to be available by next year. They're making good progress. Hopefully they'll be available by end of this year. On the charging side, uh, the key thing to note is that additional charging is needed prior to even buying the fleet. You need the charging infrastructure before you get the fleet. So that is the most important thing to note. Um, sharing charging spot between multiple vehicles, it might be cost effective, but it's not desirable to meet your level of service needs. Uh, we are also talking about power management here. So power management can slightly increase your cost, but over time in the long run, they can minimize cost, but also allow staff to monitor how your fleet are being used. We also looked at level one charging, which is essentially home charging for some city hall fleet. Um, however, we realized that uh, it is unlikely to support extreme use condition and is not being recommended and is not recommended for um, some Amish fleet at all. Finally, charging for visitors, employees, and contracted fleet. Um, they were not part of this, this study, but um, they could impact your future power needs as city facilities, so should be looked at in the future. So our fleet replacement has two parts. Uh, they are broken down by time, essentially, so near term by 2030, and then long term by 2050. And as you can see from that table on the right, uh, which is divided by vehicles and off-roads and also by duty, uh, the bright green indicates what you already have electrified and what you are potentially should electrify in the next few years by 2030. Everything else either converts to hybrid, plug-in hybrids, or switches to R99 fuel. In the long term, all those alternative fuel vehicles, um, they, could, they should switch to um, electric if suitable options are available and your budget allows and they're up for replacement. On the charging side, it's kind of similar. Um, the near term adds capacity for light duty fleet and small tools, um, essentially installing charges at City Hall where you do not actually need any service upgrade on the electricity side. Um, upgrading and partially building out MOC and upgrading service to build out the Beaver Lake shop. 
And then in the long term, you're essentially adding capacity for medium and heavy duty fleet, uh, assuming that market catches up by then. And that's when you're investing for, for larger fleet at MOC, but also at the South Yard. Um, some key assumptions here, um, service upgrade is required, as you know, in many of your facilities. Um, that does require coordination with PSC, and there is utility side cost associated with that. Uh, we are also assuming a mix of level two and level three chargers. Essentially, level two charger means your fleet are getting dedicated overnight charging, and level three is essentially uh, fast charging um, in between work activities whenever it's required. Uh, we are also considering diesel generators for backup power. Um, the cost for non-renewable sources are almost 10 times more, so we do not recommend that right now, but definitely something to look out in the future if non-renewable sources become more um, um, cost effective. And we're also adding dedicated charging space for small tools as part of this study. Next slide, please. As you can see, what um, this map shows you is where the different chargers are being planned, how many. Uh, briefly, as you can see at City Hall, it's a near-term strategy and it's a mix of level two and level three charges there. For MOC, it's split into two phases. Um, you do not need to do um, all at once, but it does require service upgrade on both sides, gets a mix of level two and three chargers, but also uh, backup power and small tool charging capacity. For Beaver Lake, um, it is a near-term uh, upgrade, service upgrade, along with providing small tool charging. It is more cost effective at that site to add a little bit of level two chargers as well as part of that same upgrade, instead of touching that site um, second time. Uh, finally, for South Yard, that is uh, at the planning level assumptions, we are proposing service upgrade, adding some level two charges and backup power, but we understand that the future of that site is yet to be determined of how the space is being used. Finally, we arrive at costs. Uh, something to note here, uh, what are included and what are not included. So the costs that are included are costs for fleet vehicle or asset replacement, whether with EV hybrids or plug-in hybrids. Uh, it includes city side costs for infrastructure upgrades. Uh, it does include costs for charging equipment and installation. And costs that are excluded by the, because they are unknown today or it's a cost that will be incurred in the future are utility side upgrades for all your three sites, uh, MOC, Beaver Lake, and South Yard. You do not need a service upgrade at this facility. Future purchase costs for fleet that you're electrifying through 2030 are also excluded. Um, pricing for R99 fill is excluded. Um, That's something that staff should follow up uh, on in terms of like how it should be sourced, distributed, and storage. Uh, we know it's available, but it still needs to be like um, reviewed by staff. Costs for uh, increased electricity use are also excluded. And then additional dedicated parking space for vehicles and off-road equipment charging is also included. Um, that is essentially accounting for a fleet that you may need in the future. So the group fleet code is excluded here. And finally, as I mentioned, charging for visitors, employees, and contracted fleet uh, will impact um, power needs city facilities, but it's being excluded as part of this study. All right, finally, the cost to fully electrify fleet uh, is 15.7 million. Um, the cost, as you should know, are rough order of magnitude in today's dollars. Um, I'll give you a brief walk down around like what the different wedges mean over here. The, the bright red up top is 5.2 million. That is uh, purchasing fleet through 2030, uh, purchasing a mix of electric and alternative fuel vehicles. In comparison, the city's current fleet costs about 4.5 million. So it's a little bit premium than what you have today. Electric vehicles cost a little bit more, but not a whole lot more. Then the pink indicates 7.2 million, that is um, fleet purchase cost between 2031 to 2050, that is conversion of alternative fuel vehicles to electric. So anything that you couldn't electrify now because the market hasn't caught up, you're electrifying it later, so that is the cost. All the greens indicate um, cost on the infrastructure side, so 1.4 for infrastructure, so that is design, planning, uh, trenching off your property, laying down the conduits and then restoring the site, all of that. Um, 850,000 for chargers, and then another 140 for backup power. And we should know that these are one-time investment, could be spread out over a few years, and it's a combined cost for all four sites. And then finally, some uh, recurring expenses um, that should be that could be applied or through 2050. This includes um, software, power management software, about 17,000 a year uh, it could cost you, and then operations and maintenance cost, about 18,000 a year. Some, something to note over here are um, this will this is a, will be the focus of the presentation at the next session. But um, all of this would require 
about 1.4 million in the next budget cycle, 2025-26, for both charging infrastructure and fleet, which is a little bit higher. It's about 160% your typical spending on fleet purchase, so something to note here. We are not excluding costs for fuel or electricity here, but currently the city does spend about 112,000 a year on fuel today, so that would need to be factored in. And then finally, the big thing that's excluded here is utility side upgrades. Um, this is something that your utility will be able to provide and requires coordination with them to understand what it'll cost. Two more slides. Um, incentives. So we briefly looked at what incentives are available to the city of Sammamish. Uh, what you see on your screen are different incentives that we looked at. They are grouped by Puget Sound Energy, Washington State, and Federal. Anything that's in great text is um, incentives that the city is not eligible for due to demographics or equity requirements. Anything that's in black, you are essentially eligible for and you could apply. Uh, some of them might require reviewing with your accountant for full eligibility, but these are things that you, sh you are eligible for. I'll briefly touch on how much on the next slide, if you don't mind. The most lucrative out of these incentives is the PSE Up and Go Fleet Program that could be a maximum of 650,000 um, spread over all four sites. Again, it depends on how many charges you're installing. There is a cap involved, a lot of caveats involved, something that needs to be reviewed with PSE. But from our understanding, you could have a maximum of 650,000 over there. And then PV, uh, PSE's EV load management incentives, that could also be something that you could get. Um, these are bill credits for off-peak charging. Um, and then revenue from low carbon fuel standard, that's from the Washington state. Um, it could be about 1.5 to 4,500 a year. As you probably know, there are periodic grants from the Washington State uh, Department of Commerce and Ecology, so something that staff regularly reviews um, and should continue to review and monitor. Um, they are not, there is no available opportunities available today that's applicable for you, but definitely something to look at um, for future. That's it, that's today's presentation. Uh, we went over your targets, the assessment of your fleet, uh, electrification approach, and then the next meeting, as I mentioned, we will walk you through the investment strategy and adoption trends and public charging. Thank you. So sorry. Um, we're gonna open up the floor for questions. I know Councilmember Gupta, you had sent in a couple in advance. Um, do you feel that they were answered through this presentation or can I provide any additional clarif clarifications? Uh, no, I'd, I'd appreciate uh, answers on them if you have them. Thanks. Sorry, what was that? No, I'd appreciate answers on them uh, if you have them. And if you'd like me to read them out, I can. Um, yes, yeah. yeah. So um, there was a brief discussion on, or. Uh, Councilmember Gupta had asked a question on the uh, small tools on slide 13. Krista, do you mind pulling up that presentation? Sorry about that. Um, so as we discussed, small tools um, currently with the level of service and the technology available, um, it is at not eligible for electrification in the very short term. We do need to make sure that there's charging infrastructure set up and that our maintenance crews um, have equipment that is going to be able to maintain our level of service. Um, that being said, we do need to account for the charging infrastructure. So that is where that is taken into account. So um, those costs are included up to 2030 while um, electrification of those tools is under further review. Um, the next question was sourcing R99 fuel. Um, so I think as we did mention in uh, the presentation, R99 fuel is going to be used for those vehicles that are not eligible for full electrification or plug-in hybrid or hybrid vehicles. So any of those that cannot be electrified or replaced with hybrid, we are looking to um, put that drop in fuel replacement to reduce emissions. And PSC conversations are ongoing um, regarding the service upgrades. PSC does need uh, plans and an actual site plan and, and development plans in order to provide us those um, infrastructure level of service upgrade costs. I also did want to just clarify um, on the costs diagram, which is, um, slide, if you could go down, Krista. Continue, please. It is the big donut. Thank you. 
Um, so 5.2 million uh, on the fleet spending through 2030 is specifically for that subset of vehicles that will be replaced through 2030. So that is not to electrify the full fleet. That is a 5.2 million cost for those vehicles that we're looking at for near term electrification. Comparatively, um, the 4.2 million is the cost of the entire fleet today. So that 5.2 million is a subset of the entire fleet. Any other questions? Councilor Gupta, did you want to continue? Yeah, thank you. Um, so a couple of other questions that I had. Uh, I know at the Sustainability Commission meeting last week, um, it was the possibility was brought up of adjusting our level of service in parks um, mm -hmm. as an alternative. Like as you mentioned, the small tool charging is not an immediate thing that we can take on. So. I just wanted to raise that as something that I, I would like to learn more about on what the challenges are, what the costs might be to go to every other week mow and blow as opposed to every week, um, just so we can get some numbers on um, what we're saving, what our emissions uh, savings might be, and, and what the challenges are. Um, yeah. yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. Um, so the actual emissions emitted by our small tools with our current level of service was not part of the scope of the study, um, but actually looking at changing that level of service would require a conversation um, and significant community and park user outreach. Um, our community does love our parks and they expect a certain level of service. So to change that level of service, we'd wanna make sure that we're involving the community in those discussions um, and doing appropriate outreach to folks who really love to use our parks. And uh, I think that's why it would be helpful to just get an understanding of what, how much money are we saving? What, are, what emissions are we, could we potentially save there? So we can see if it's worth you know, taking the outreach step. Um, yeah. I, I also wanted to highlight just, um, so from my understanding, we worked backwards from the emission reductions uh, at, from this study of this is our goal for 2030, what steps would we need to take to hit that? Um, so I just wanted to see if we had an understanding of instead of replacing our fleet um, as depicted in this graph, what does it look like for both cost and emissions reduction if we replace our vehicles at end of life? and and then replace them with electric vehicles. So what does that look like? How far do we come off of our goal if we do that and how much, what is our expense? So I believe that question will be mostly answered in our uh, subsequent presentation in June. Um, we are gonna be showing what the costs are today uh, across the average. Obviously we can't completely project that out um, given the changing prices of vehicles on the market. They've fluctuated a lot over the past few years, as I'm sure you are aware. Um, so we'll be looking at how much the city has been spending on average and how much above that cost um, we would need to invest for the infrastructure, chargers, and electrification. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Howe. Thank you for the presentation, it's very helpful. And I'm just kind of piggyback on what you just were talking about, Rose, because um, my question has to do with, with pricing. We know that electrification over time pays off, but I did, needed to see what the timeline looked like before we started to get to something that looked rational because it is so expensive, as you as you pointed out. I am wondering if pressure from China and Chinese vehicles is going to help drive the cost down as long as there's no tariffs put on them, because the Chinese vehicles are, comparatively speaking, much less expensive than ones manufactured in the US. Do we have to buy US? That's think, a question. That's a great question for John, our fleet and facilities superintendent. What? I seriously can't hear you. They just put tariffs on today. <laughs> so the way we buy our vehicles from the city, we don't go down to a dealership. Um, this, we buy off the state bid site. So um, uh, Department of Enterprise Services in Olympia, it kind of sets a lot of uh, state contracts. That's what we piggyback off of to buy all of our vehicles. So everything is already a pre-negotiated price and, and basically like a, a, a static build. Um, to where it's not like the same vehicle you would get if you went to a dealership. It has way less options and you just kind of go through and build based on your need. So we're already getting a pretty significant price decrease of what's already agreed upon by the state. Um, so I don't know how much that might actually impact it. 
Okay, thank, thank you, that's really helpful. And I also wanted to understand the cost of maintenance because do we have staff that can maintain this type of vehicle because I'm assuming it's different? Not currently, but, but that, is, um, that is something that we're looking at as how do we maintain these vehicles in the future as kind of part of our purchasing strategy and life cycle management. So right. nothing solid right now, but it's, it's something that we are looking at. Because the other part of this is that, um, you know, as the batteries expire, there are places where the, that they can be rebuilt, but there's not a ton of those. So part of it's even factoring in the battery replacement in, in over time, for yep. example. Um, thank you, that's really helpful. My next question has to do actually with slide 12, and it does have to do with the, the uh, level of service, because I truly did not understand when you were talking about their small tools and motors may impact level of service. Why would electrification impact level of service? Are you saying it's not very good? Are you saying they don't really clip or it doesn't move? Not powerful mm. enough? The I, th I think the issue there is that if you electrify small tools and motor, there are no reliable options that you can go for today, and it requires you to like r repeatedly charge them, so it can provide the same level of service, but you'll need to probably charge them more than what you typically fill them. So that's so more the more time. It takes more time, yeah. So it could cost more in terms of staff time. Exactly. Okay. And Deputy Mayor, if I may jump in here, I also think that they're not as powerful as the combustion vehicle, uh, small tools, and so it takes longer to do the same thing, yeah. as well as having to stop and recharge if you were not a battery juice. Okay, because to me, this isn't really level of service, it's really a, an additional cost, but I, I understand the point. Um, the other question I had, no, actually, the, that's exactly what I wanted to cover. Thank you very much. Councilmember Lamb. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, if I may just add, um, just to clarify that level of service as well, um, we do have a small tools infrastructure memo that will be coming as part of the final report that outlines some of this in detail with data to back it up as well. Um, but a lot of times these electric vehicles are heavier due to the batteries that they have, um, which can be t rougher on staff, which means they may need to be taking more breaks, which plays into the time. And also there is associated costs with additional batteries because one battery with a commercial level of service is not going to be meeting the same time requirements and, and blowing requirements as you might if you're in a residential home using an electric blower. So we need to consider the scale of which um, we're using these tools as well. Councilmember Lamb. Um, I had a couple of questions. So on the small tools, the 164, I think it would be really helpful to have the emissions quantified. Am I, did I not understand that it's gonna be coming in later or because um, blowers and, and chainsaws, I mean, they're, they're heavily polluting. And if we're gonna quantify how much we're reducing emissions, it'd be really great to understand what we're reducing when we electrify the 164 uh, small tools. Absolutely. Um, I think part of that is a lot of our tools are used by different staff members. And so um, when you're looking at the hour meter usage for the tools, you're able to make some data assumptions. Mm -hmm. um, but I think kind of taking it at a higher level, if you think about a level of service and you think about mowing a park once a week, and how much emissions are associated with that. If you were to mow every other week, you would cut your emissions in half. So kind of knowing that anecdotally, um, I hear what you're saying about having the data would be helpful and some of that will be laid out in, in the infrastructure memo, but it's really hard to quantify with the number of tools and the variety of uses for our tools to get an actual number um, for those emissions. Rish, feel free to jump in it. I think Rose is right. It's essentially you don't have enough data or you're not tracking small tools in order to like estimate the emissions like you would bond for the fleet. So you have a good estimate of like how your fleet is being filled. So hence we could estimate the emissions. So same thing for off-road equipment. You have data, which is why we could. But as Rose mentioned, you do not have sufficient data for the small tools that we could estimate the emissions over there. Um, 
I'm not clear on that, and I, I guess it, there must be some way to estimate that whether or not you're like saying uh, we're you know we mow x we you know use the blower for these parks and for how long. Like I'm just trying to get an estimate only because it it is good for our residents to understand if we're going to reduce our emissions, we're going to in totality. This is the effort that you know, we're putting in to reducing it, and this includes the small tools, and this is how much we're reducing it by. I just think having those numbers is really important. Yeah, so the small tools is the really difficult one. Um, so those are the things that a lot of folks are using on the side of the road and in the parks. Mm -hmm. um, anytime they have um, a weed eater out, yes, a maintenance worker might be tasked to go weed eat the side of a road. They may have six hours they're working on that work order but we have nothing on that equipment that actually says that weed eater was running for three, four hours straight at full throttle, so it was emitting. So we have no way to calculate that. And that's where the real challenge is, is how many hours is that piece of equipment actually working at one specific site for that one work task? Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so everything's an estimation if we, if we were to use it. I still think an estimation is probably better than nothing. Okay. Yeah. Um, my other question has to do with the cost of um, electrifying the fleet. Um, so it's like, I think, how many millions? 15 million? So the, our, our vehicles are, you know, there's value to our vehicles now. And is that taken into account? Like, do we sell the vehicles? And so therefore, we're gonna have this like chunk of money, you know, so that it doesn't look like we're spending $15 million outright because our vehicles are actually valued at a dollar right now at, at cost. No, the depreciated value of vehicles was not considered. This is just uh, the purchase price of a new vehicle. Okay, so will that be accounted for? We are not currently accounting for that, no. Okay. Um. So can I just clarify? Yeah. I think um, what the study looks at is we would be we would be purchasing new vehicles regardless. Mm -hmm. And I think what I had heard in the presentation was that the delta between what we would spend now under current our current vehicle replacement versus what it would cost to convert those that we can to electric. I think there was a delta of about seven hundred thousand, if I recall correctly. Um, and, and it doesn't, that doesn't include when the vehicle um, ages out, if you will, it goes on, we put it back into the surplus pool, right, John, and we get some, some dollar amount for it. And that's, that's rolled into basically the, the fleet's budget that, that accounts for that piece of it. But we're talking about, and this is looking at what it would cost to purchase those. So yes, there will be some offset, if you will, mm -hmm. but this is just looking at what it would cost to purchase those up front because the purchase price of that new vehicle is higher on average than it is for a regular vehicle. Right, so as we move along in the process, will we get like an, a better understanding of that delta? Um, we, can, we can pull the delta out of what we've done over the past. I know we've, we've got those numbers and we can provide those. They, it won't necessarily be one-to-one -one because the vehicles don't sell necessarily for the same thing. Right. So it depends on the vehicle, on how old it is. Council could choose as part of this to sort of amend the vehicle replacement schedule and do it all sort of upfront, if you will. And so we might get higher value for newer vehicles if we were to turn around and sell them, but that's a policy choice that we'll get down the road. We we're just trying to look at a snapshot in time and what we would do if, so that's what this does okay. at the moment. I'm just trying to get a better understanding of the true cost. Yeah, and I think those are that's the, the next step down the road is to really get at the true cost. Because there, as the this study pointed out, there are some unknowns that we don't have right now, and that gets also at that true cost um, of, of what this would be, so. Okay, great, thank you. Councilmember Treen. I guess I'll go right to you then, Scott, since you just mentioned that. So, because the, the one thing that concerns me uh, the most about this, looking at it from a big picture point of view, is if, we, if you're gonna electrification, the, the whole process, citywide, fleet, whatever, emergency response, the rest of it, right, is the unknown future costs. So it, you have a list here on uh, the slide before the big donut one, you know, what's it gonna cost for 
fleet electrification through 2030, what about our fuel and sourcing and pricing, increased electrical use, additional dedicated parking spaces. Okay, that's asphalt on the ground. So when I start looking at, just looking at those prices alone, you're, this, this cost to fully electrify $15.7 million is, is not a real number to me. That's, that's, okay, that's, for what you're saying you're gonna provide, I get it, that's a real number, right? But what I'm saying is a council member, when I'm looking at this and then I have to balance out, okay, how do I budget for this? How do we actually pay for it? And then what do I lose if I say yes to it? So it, is the study gonna bring me back this unknown future cost? That's the first question. Then I have one for Anjali. Um, well, council member, at the moment, like I said, this is the snapshot in time. Some of those future costs are the reason they're future is they haven't been identified yet, for instance. We don't know what kind of cost it would be for PSE to upgrade, for instance, the line into the MOC. Um, and that would have to happen in order for us to be able to make this happen. So it's not just future costs, it's also some future pieces that we don't know when that might be possible to do. Um, and, and again, this is the starting point, and we wanted to bring this back um, as part of the response to uh, Council's Climate Action Plan, and I think this is a great first step. And this, um, this gets us to a much better knowledge base uh, to some other council member of your colleagues' questions about what kind of data do we have. I think that's part of this as we move forward is trying to get a better understanding, but um, this is what the best that we have right at the moment. So I would look forward then to seeing what Puget Sound Energy, because I don't know how to put it this way, so let me see if I can backtrack for just a second. It, if a city was to spend a lot of money to actually reduce, be serious about um, uh, reductions of, uh, to take away some of the impact that the city has on the climate uh, by reducing emissions, the, the biggest center or person, company that's impacting the climate right now is Puget Sound Energy. So if I were to, I forget electrifying the fleet at 15.7 million, if $15.7 million would help PSE to reduce carbon emissions in the city by whether that's hydroelectric, solar, wind, or something that we don't know of yet. So that's, that's my first point. And I was kind of surprised that this study didn't bring that kind of information to us to just say, hey, look, if you really want to have a serious impact on um, uh, combating climate change and emissions, then we need to go to the power company. That's, so if, if that's not going to come to us, that's great. Um, no, it's not great. That's tragic for me as a council member to think that we don't have some kind of impact on Puget Sound Energy or couldn't with the amount of money that you guys are talking, that we're talking about here in this presentation. So if, if that's not gonna happen, then I, I, I kind of question as to why we even did the study. But I, I, I just throw that out to you that if that's, is that even a possibility? If I may respond, Council Member Trina, I, I, if, um, I would suggest that we separate those two pieces out. This study was to look at how we could what impact we could have at the city, the things that we have control over. And so that's why this is looking at our fleet. I think uh, Puget Sound Energy, you're, you're not incorrect about that, but that's um, not something that we have specific control over. And so that's how I would separate those two pieces out to say that you know part of the, our climate action plan is both looking at things that the city has control over that we can actually make changes on, and the other piece of this is um, changing hearts and minds in the community about people taking action, other agencies and organizations taking action, and, and that's a piece that we don't have control over. And so um, we are focused at the moment about the things that we have direct control over, and that's what this study in particular looks at while recognizing that there are other things out there that will have and could have a major impact but are not, are out of our span of control. All right, I'll take that under advisement, thanks. Uh, Anjali, I was just wondering, um, there was, um, I mean, the Parks Department uses most of the small tools. 
the, the other one, um, the ga gators, we have gators in the fleet, is that correct? And those are mostly gas powered uh, vehicles, correct? Okay, and uh, w there's not a plan to replace those at this time, is that correct? It, is that, or is that part of the small tools or is that part of the uh, larger fleet, the, the gators <laughs> specifically? The gators are uh, part of the off-road off -road equipment. That's the yeah. off-road equipment. Yeah. Okay. And, and we think that's a possibility of actually changing some of those out. Yeah, I, I believe we already have one electric uh, gator in the city. So we do have that, yeah. Cool. And then as far as the, um, hi, I, you know me, I, I, I worked parks for three and a half years. I, um, I ran small tools. Uh, the amount of emissions that's coming out of there, it, it, as far as the overall picture, seems like a small amount. Um, would it be nice if we could electrify them? Sure, but if it's not part of this study, are, are you going to look at, like, um, would it even be feasible to do that, or would it be res even responsible for the council to spend this kind of money to do that kind of uh, electrification on something that's such a small return on the it's a small return on investment, but the, um, probably the charging capacity also needed is proportionately smaller. I think the main thing for us to see is technology is constantly changing. As explained right now, the uh, life of the battery and the power of the tool, you have to plan for twice the time. So you're yep. basically doubling your operation costs, and that's the decision that Council has to make. What I also want to share is we are trying to stay on top of what's out there in the market. I think there's a lot of saying what we can't do. We want to share what we are doing. We already have one electric gator. We have about 14 um, hand blowers and chainsaws. Um, and we've also recently bought a couple of backpack blowers and we are testing those out constantly. And we do use them for our trails and our preserves. So you can blow out the leaves from trails and get some of that out. We also have to keep in mind that we have both in-house services and we contract out quite a bit for our parks. And so when we contract out, that's the part where we're having a hard time finding uh, companies that at a commercial scale are able to uh, carry the adequate tool. So you would basically double up on your contract costs even if they existed. So that's one of the challenges. And then I just wanted to add that with our sports fields, we do mow them in-house. Right now, you don't have mowers that are big enough um, electric mowers. You have the biggest one is six feet wide, whereas we use 11 foot wide mowers in-house and we mow those fields thrice a week and we would not be able to rent them out. So no. if we change that level of service and started mowing them every other week, you wouldn't be able to rent the fields out. We could look at something like that for our other lawns that are not our, uh, soccer fields and baseball fields. But then you run into other things like you end up with more weeds and sometimes when you come back at the second week, you may have to mow it twice to get it right. So yeah, I think the best thing is to, the biggest learning from the study is we have to get our infrastructure going first. And technology is changing constantly in a couple of years. By the time we have the infrastructure, there may be better equipment out there. So the cost of the infrastructure to put in, what, uh, what's the offset? What, what, what would the council have to say, okay, when it comes to budget time, um, I'm gonna get this, but I lose this. So here, let me ask you a question a little bit different because I'm, I'm looking for something specific. So let's just get right to that is, Acquisition to me of buying land is the number one way to get parks and to preserve open space. It's no better way than that. So is that money, could, could the council uh, attach, uh, take that money and spend it towards electrification? Yeah, it wasn't going to be easy tonight, sorry. But. <laughs> Councilor Trina, I mean, I just, uh, in response to that, I think council always has the choice to spend money wherever they deem uh, appropriate. Would would uh, would the city manager or the uh, departs, uh, Anjali, would you, would you as a, a professional staff person recommend that we spend our money for electric, electric, uh, electrification over acquisition? 
Council Member Train, I think those are separate items, if I may. Um, I think those are, that's, again, those are, those are policy and, and budget decisions for council to make. Um, and when, if and when we get to that point, I think those, we would have that conversation with council um, about competing priorities. Are the acquisition dollars locked in or are they available for electrification? Currently acquisition dollars are in the capital fund and that's a separate fund from, um, uh, uh, that's a separate account, it's in the parks capital improvement fund at the moment. So those funds are sitting there and council could always choose to take those funds out if they saw fit. Right now, they're, that's where they're sitting and um, at the moment, I'm not gonna recommend changing anything about that um, as we move forward looking at all the, the priorities that council has laid out for us. Thank you, I'm done. I'm gonna go first if that's okay. Um, uh, yeah, thank you for all this information, Rish. This is super helpful. I'm definitely looking for a balance and uh, I'm glad that everyone's like trying things out and options, uh, cause it is, I think probably every city is struggling with this and it's ever changing and going to be probably for some time. So I'm definitely looking forward to finding what is the best for staff. And like, if we can't project these long terms, what does it look like? You know, for replacing vehicles that aren't at end of life, is that really the best? <laughs> you know, is that, you know, or do we wait till end of life, you know, and adjust some of these numbers? But this is really good information and I'm looking forward to you both coming back or I don't know who's coming back, but Rose at least, so. Awesome, uh, Council Member Lamb. Um, I just wanted to note that um, Council Member Train was saying that the small tools um, would make a small dent, I guess he was saying, but the emissions from a gas powered leaf blower running that for one hour produces as much emissions as driving a light duty passenger car, a newer model for 1,100 miles, and that is significant. So if we have 14 um, leaf blowers, that's a significant amount of emissions. Thanks. All right, Rose, what do you have for us coming back? I can have a lot. So oh yeah, sorry, Deputy Mayor Howe. Just, just one last thing, because I'm wondering, is there a way to leverage what we're learning here in terms of the electrification process? for the city and then translate it in such a way so that residents understand not just what we're doing, but what they need to do. Because clearly what we're doing is insignificant because we're a city that has 164 small tools. Okay, so if there are a lot more residents actually that probably could yeah, add to that list. So what, I'm, what I'd love to figure out though, the things that we've learned or you know, like the, the way that we've done something, is there any way that we can help pass on that information in such a way that this makes it a glide path for residents to see how they can do their swaps for that EV or that small tool or what have you? Um, yeah, so part of the work of the Sustainability Commission is changing hearts and minds. Um, that's often at the top of my mind as well in the work that I'm doing day to day. I think uh, having, to put it, getting our own house in order and then sharing lessons learned with the community, publicizing this study. We are coming back at a, at a future study session in June to um, provide information on public charging trends and EV adoption in Sammamish. So you'll get some baseline numbers on how Sammamish compares to other jurisdictions and where our electrification is um, as a community at the next uh, presentation. Can you make that a dashboard? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Um, all right, so you're coming back? Yes. Awesome. Yeah, so we'll be coming back. Um, Great. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rish. Thank yeah. you, Elle. Thanks thank so much. You. All righty, um, next we're gonna have Audrey and Greg for our 2025 to 2030 tip and swip intro.
Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, joining me this evening is Greg Samatio, our Deputy Public Works Director, and I am Audrey Starcy, um, Public Works Director for the City, and we very much look forward to uh, providing a high-level presentation for our 2025 through 2030 Transportation Improvement Plan, or TIP, as well as an introduction to our 25 through 30 um, Stormwater Improvement Plan, or SWIP. And bear with me here while I start my presentation. So this is a fairly brief um, presentation. We are very excited to um, come back in June with the TIP and the SWIP in their draft formats for conversation as well as public hearing. Um, this evening, um, we'll be providing a quick background and purpose for the TIP and the SWIP, and we'll um, go through project prioritization as well as revenue assumptions for both plans and a sneak peek on what's new for both plans and as well as share some up, um, upcoming important dates. So this slide should look a little bit familiar. Um, some of this content was shared in April as Greg and I provided um, an introduction to capital project planning in the world of public works. Um, so the graphic on your right shows the life cycle of an average asset, assuming a 30-year life span lifespan of that asset. And of course, the planning phase, those two triangles highlighted in blue, um, are, are quite a bit of the time. Once we get to construction and maintenance, um, that's really what the community sees, but what the city is working on behind the scenes is, is a majority of that, um, of those other years for that life lifespan of that asset. Capital plans are extremely important. They prioritize projects and funding for six years. Um, as we work towards our first citywide CIP, it's really important that we as a city can prioritize our projects and funding for six years across all, all different types of projects. Capital plans improve trust and transparency, align with community goals and service expectations, mitigate risk, um, improve public safety, they are always looking towards um, the latest and greatest in terms of technology and equipment and different ways of, of doing things so we can provide innovative solutions to some of our projects. Capital plans work towards fiscal sustainability and identify forecasted capital expenditures, revenue sources, and funding gaps. Capital plans are extremely important for most of our funding and grant um, opportunities. And for many grants, they're actually required. We cannot apply for that grant unless we have a capital plan that's adopted in place. For the transportation improvement plan, all cities in Washington state must adopt a six-year plan pursuant to RCW 3577010. This slide, there's more details in our April presentation to council. Um, this is just to show the life cycle of a project, a capital project in the world of public works or any, actually any capital project in the city. Um, most of our, our projects do start out as community requests or through um, larger planning exercises such as um, corridor plans, or transit plans, in stormwater world, our basin plans. Many of our projects are also the result of our stormwater permit requirements. Through careful evaluation analysis by, by staff, all of our projects are scored and added to our 20-year list and our transportation master plan or our storm and surface water plan. And um, projects that we can complete in the interim um, can be completed through our, our public works operations teams. Um, and in the meantime, all of those projects are added to our six-year um, plans as well. So ideally, our six-year planning window is a, a six-year window um, that just kind of slides along a 20-year window for uh, capital plans as they're presented in our master plans. So we are here today as outlined in that green box, and then next steps later on this year, we'll be working on our citywide capital improvement program, which will be um, lining up with our budget cycle. So our stormwater and transportation projects are evaluated and scored um, a little bit differently. So resolution 2018-804 um, um, outlines very detailed the different criteria for stormwater projects. They are different types of projects and different type of work, so that's why they have a little bit different cri criteria. Um, you can see there are several criteria there that are the same. Our transportation projects were previously um, scored to a scale of 420 points with this year's tip, 
we made an improvement, and so we are converting those 420-point um, scales to a score of 100, uh, excuse me, 100 points, um, so that the two plants have very similar um, um, point scales to them. So revenue assumptions for both um, types of plans. You can see um, both types of plans have different revenue sources. Um, and I'll kind of start at the bottom and then work my way up as the, the very top has a few different differences. So um, of course we would love to partner on projects any opportunity we can. We often um, can work with schools, other agencies such as King County, um, other cities and um, DOT. We have done so very recently on, on capital projects. And of course there's always opportunity to work um, with private par public partnerships as well on capital improvement projects. We also very much um, appreciate any grant opportunity, whether that's local, state, or federal grants. Um, sometimes our projects don't fit within those windows, but having a capital plan is the first step um, towards looking to see if we qualify for many of our grants. The Stormwater Capital Fund is often referred to as the 438 fund. So that fund can only pay for stormwater improvements. So you'll see the box checked in transportation projects. Um, a lot of our transportation projects have stormwater infrastructure in them, so they pay for their proportionate share of those transportation projects. The 438 fund um, typically starts with the beginning fund balance in our budget books, and as well as our six-year plan, and that beginning uh, fund balance, the primary revenue source for the 438 fund is our surface water management or SWIM fees. Those fees are set by council. Um, through our utility rate study that was recently completed in 2022. That rate study also set and council set um, an enhanced level of service for the utility to operate at, which includes um, a majority of the projects that are on our stormwater improvement plan. And finally, the transportation fund, often referred to as the 340 fund. We usually start with the beginning fund balance. With this particular tip, we'll start with our beginning fund balance in 2025. Um, and then we take a look at our projected forecasts um, for REIT. Those are, we work very closely with our finance um, department to determine our REIT forecast for the six year horizon. It is based on, I think a 10 or 11 year average. Um, and the forecast is still um, holding true at about $3 million a year. Um, and another revenue source for the 340 fund is our TIF or traffic impact fees. Right now that is forecast at 2.54 million a year. And of course, um, there's always opportunity for council to decide to fund some, some portion of transportation projects from the general fund as well. So our six year tip, uh, both plans consist of a spreadsheet and guide. These were improvements that we made in the last two years. Um, these formats will stay, so the, the formatting of the TIP and SWIP will be very consistent. We've had a lot of really great feedback from the community that the, the plans are very easy to read. So we look forward to continuing that formatting. <clears throat> the TIP spreadsheet itself um, includes a, a variety of projects and projects are added to either our ongoing projects, which can, be, which can be found at the top of the spreadsheet, kind of in those green boxes, or they are added to a category down below, yellow, blue, gray, and purple boxes. Um, and the category, um, they're placed within those categories that really align them with similar projects. Once in that category, we use a priority score to rank the projects within those categories. So our project categories consist of traffic safety and non-motorized improvement, connection projects, corridor improvement projects, and regional projects that the, the city may choose to participate in or of, of significance regionally. Um, accompanying our spreadsheet is our tip guide. Our tip guide is a little bit more detail oriented. It includes things like our, um, um, sorry, revenue assumptions that spells out all the details for TIF in REIT, it includes descriptions of the projects, it includes um, the connection to city goals, how, how that particular project may be accomplishing a um, goal from the comprehensive plan or other important city plans. And it also um, outlines our scoring methodology for each project. Our web, web page link down below provides an opportunity for um, the public to go and look at 
the 2024 to 2029 TIP, as well as any prior year TIPs. Um, in the next few weeks, we'll have the draft 2025 through 2030 TIP available for um, review. Our stormwater improvement plan looks very similar to our TIP. You'll see lots of different colors on that spreadsheet as well. Um, our programs on the SWIP are highlighted in blue. Those were ongoing programs um, that were funded through, they're identified through the rate study and setting um, levels of service for the utility a few years ago. Um, a very important program to highlight is our stormwater um, facility retrofit program, and that program was identified through our strategic retrofit um, study that was completed a few years ago. So it's a really, really neat program. We're very excited about it. Projects are, can also be found in several categories in this, in this SWIP. It just delineates those types of categories by um, how large the projects are in terms of forecasted costs. The guide for the SWIP is very similar to the TIPS. So you'll find revenue assumptions, project descriptions, scoring, and connection to city goals um, in the SWIP as well. There's a link at the bottom where you can find the web page as well as um, that particular web page also has um, hyperlinks to all, all of our projects that are on the SWIP. Um, so you can read a little bit more about each project as well. So what's new? We are um, really excited this year to unveil in the next little bit an interactive GIS map that we have been working on. Um, it'll be launched to the community. Um, where it's in beta mode right now, but we're very excited about it. Um, we will be able to filter by project, by project phase, by year. Um, so really looking forward to that um, so that we can look at things across the city. Um, project summaries will be included in the guide in the, for the TIP and the SWIP. These will mirror what will be found in the citywide um, capital improvement program later this year. This year's TIP and SWIP will also include um, forecasted costs for right-of-way acquisition as well as escalators. And we do have a handful of new projects and programs that are proposed to be included on this year's SIP. Um, we'd like to highlight the transit enhancement program, which includes projects from our transit plan that was recently adopted in March. Some of those um, projects include a crosswalk study, our bus stop amenity program, um, transit operation improvement, as well including um, transit signal priority or TSP. We are recommending at this time that all of those projects be folded into one, one program that really enhances transit, um, since we'll be looking at different opportunities um, um, to enhance transit through, through access primarily, so we can hopefully boost ridership. Um, another program, we are just changing a little bit of the wording on the program and the intent of the program. So currently on our tip, you'll see a street light program that was set aside um, for the purposes of installing one to two additional street lights um, as, as requested and as identified by staff for safety improvements. We would like to take a step back and create a street light enhancement program that could do a little bit more. So we'll start out with a citywide streetlight plan that first maps all of our streetlights and identifies areas to start converting to LED. Um, that plan will also be crucial in terms of uh, being able to identify areas of the city that may need additional lighting, such as near our bus stops. And finally, we'll see a few more projects in our connections category. There's a really important um, category on our tip that provides important projects um, that can connect the community. So we are looking at timing and phasing for 6th Street um, near Town Center as well as our Northeast Connector. So more updates for both of those are coming in June. And finally, we will be back with both of these plans um, in early June and later on in June as we open the public hearing and um, discuss these plans with council and the community. And of course, we welcome any and all public comment in between. With that, I will hand it back over to you, Mayor, if there's any questions. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, sorry, where are escalators going? Did I? <laughs> like, oh, <laughs> cost escalators. <laughs> yeah, cost escalators. <laughs> sorry. Oh, I Although was like, would be what? Fine. Okay, I was, sorry. Okay. It's going to solve uh, all of our, uh, you know, getting down to <laughs> six mammoths. Yeah, it's going to be super great. Just an Inglewood escalator. All right, uh, Deputy Mayor Howe. Uh, thanks. This was really helpful. I feel like I have a good grounding in what to 
be looking forward to here in the future. I just had one quick question, and I was really excited to have you actually say that you were taking a step back and looking at the streetlight program, because that I just want to make sure I understand what I think that means also, is that you're looking at light pollution as well. So you're looking at, yes, being able to make a safe street, but not um, going up in places where we shouldn't be potentially. So I assume that that's what you meant when you said you were taking a step back and really assessing the whole lighting program. Is that right? Yes, to some degrees. And I would just preface that would be that the lighting that the city has control over, which is primarily on our arterials, our principal and minor arterials, as well as our collectors. So other areas in the city um, are actually those light poles are maintained privately through HOAs. So I just did taking not a, a look that. at our city owned poles. We, we own and operate about 500 of our streetlights. Wow, I wonder if that's an opportunity to reach out to HOAs to help them <laughs> consider, because does it say, it, I'm assuming that going to LEDs is cost effective. Are, are, aren't they already LED, some kind of LED? They're not. They are not LEDs. We have a handful that have been converted as they have have um, burnt out and we've replaced bulbs, but often that conversion requires other hardware. Um, that's why it's, oh. it'll be listed in the capital improvement plan because it's not just swapping out bulbs. It may be a, a full arm okay. or, or something else. Well, so. I'll be I'll be tracking this a bit and trying to learn as, as you go with this so that I understand what, is there any way that we could encourage the HOAs to take a look at doing the same type of thing? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Councilmember O'Farrell. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just had really, I just wanted to comment first on that slide when it says what's new. It's very exciting. I love this whole idea about this, uh, uh, the streetwide, uh, the citywide streetlight plan. Thank you, That's, that sounds great. And uh, there's certainly cities, there's certainly streets around our, our cities, notably Southeast 24th, which happens to be near my house, which has large patches, which are very, very dark. And it would be great to kind of get an assessment of streets like that, but how we can enhance those. So I'm looking forward to that. And thank you for taking that on. Um, I just had one question when we on uh, the tip, particularly when we have um, various projects that we want to tackle over the next six years or and time beyond that. And when we're evaluating where on the plan they go, is there a, is, when we do that evaluation and if we have a project, say for example, that's kind of further down the list, in order for that project to move up the list, it has to begin to score higher in order to make its way up the list. The, we don't have any other way of taking a project that's say at the bottom and moving it up to the top just because that would be a fun thing to do. It has to <laughs> make its way up the plan by scoring higher as it goes along. I'm right in saying that. That's correct. Um, we will always have an unending list of projects, and I wish that we could fund them all and complete them all, but um, at the same time, um, you know, in, in reality, we have worked very hard to have a, a prioritization system so that it, we are both very transparent with the community and how we are approaching projects and, and keeping those in priority order. Um, occasionally, we will have a grant opportunity that might be the third ranked project down, and it might be push that project forward a year or two because of the grant funding opportunity, but okay. ideally it would be funded in the six year window. Okay. But this system um, guards against pet projects and that type of thing that we have justification yes. for doing what we're doing. Great, thank you very much, I appreciate that. And, and Mayor, if, if I may, just to highlight how one thing might move up when it, when it wasn't necessarily on the list, Lewis Thompson was not the highest priority project but because it started as a stormwater project and was converted into a road project, it moved to the top of the list um, in order to do it at the same time. So that's another way that projects move up if they're in combination with another component or there's something else going on at the same time and we wanna try to meet that. I know I had a conversation with a couple of you about not being in the road more than once if we don't have to uh, and trying to marry up those projects. So there's there's more than one way for things to move, but the scoring criteria is to, to um, there's very scarce resources for many projects and we have to have a way to say, why does one project get funded and not another? Council Member Train. Yeah, can you give me a little more information on the connection projects, please, both of them? 
course. The connections category was um, created with the intent um, to provide more connection for the community. This is something that we've heard over and over again um, when we are engaging with the community that we need more, more connection in general. So these were created, they're a little bit different than corridor projects. They're not a huge um, corridor that spans the, the city. They're a little bit different in nature. So the two that we did discuss, there's a handful of others in that category. Um, one was Sixth Street and one was, I'm sorry, let me just bring up my slides here, but the north Northeast Connector, if I recall correctly, um, we are looking at both timing as well as project scope and configuration for both of those projects. And are both of those in the town center zone area? Yes. Yeah. So we have fourth and then two blocks from that's going to be a sixth. And and do you have the uh, any idea right now on the funding of that? If it's going to be on a six year tip, who's funding that? All, all of those project details we're, we're finalizing right now. So what will be shared um, in June is a, a project forecast summary that identifies all of the different funding components for a project, whether that's grants, uh, private partnership, the city, another agency, or multiple agencies. So all of that will be included with, with the project update in the guide that will accompany the tip. And that would we're include the developer? Those. It, it could for different projects. There are a lot of opportunities for public-private partnerships that we could advance projects that would benefit the community. Is there any uh, projects that scored high enough on the connects to connect uh, t down to 244th to the, on the north um, end of the city? That is a great question, and I don't have our larger list that we're, we're looking at and right in front of me so i might need to get back to you on that one we can certainly have that ready prior to the june meetings yeah because i I'll, I'll look too through the the draft and just see if i can identify which one that would be because we we've looked at that for several several years as one of the uh, connecting the neighbors up on the hill and bringing them down onto 244th and saving them a lot of commute time and idle time so all right thanks thank you all right council anything on tip and swip before we move to snow plows all right audrey take it away okay um dan johnson our streets and stormwater maintenance superintendent should be joining us as well remotely and i will bring the presentation up here Okay, um, very much looking looking forward to discussing our snow and ice management program with you this evening, particularly um, our level of service and looking at some different opportunities um, for a different level of service going forward. Um, joining me tonight is Greg Samati, our Deputy Director. I am the Director of Public Works, Audrey Sarsi and Dan Johnson, our Streets and Stormwater Maintenance, atten sorry, maintenance Superintendent is um, online with us as well. So we'll quickly provide an overview of our program and we would like to show, showcase some of our program accomplishments and improvements over the last winter storm season. Um, and then we'll dive into some of our level of service options for you to consider. We do have a recommendation as well as a, a prepared motion for your consideration at the end of the slides. So taking a few steps back, we just wanted to highlight what snow and ice management is. Um, it's often referred to as snow and ice control. Um, this is the maintenance that is performed on public streets that is required to clear and remove any snow and control ice from designated assets. Um, in Sammamish, a majority of our network is road network is um, maintained by the city. It is the organization, in this case, the city's response um, during, before, and after snow and ice weather events. So a snow and ice uh, management plan is vital to any program, and this plan sets the stage for all things snow and ice. Um, a snow and ice management plan provides safe and accessible lifeline routes, or no, otherwise known as priority routes, on our key streets during inclement weather. Um, it defines a level of service for snow and ice control, optimizes resource allocation, and, and very importantly, sets um, service ex expectations for the community. Ideally, a plan is flexible enough that it is 
We can incorporate technology and equipment advances as they occur. And of course, it needs to align with other plans and goals, such as our climate action plan, um, including the presentation you received earlier on fleet electrification. Um, our snow and ice plan very much influences our other maintenance programs, including street sweeping, um, storm drain cleaning, uh, debris cleanup and disposal in uh, our pavement management program. So a very foundational component of any snow and ice management plan or often referred to as a policy um, is setting level of service. So this is something that we are asking council to consider tonight. Once level of service is set, we'll be back with a, a draft snow and ice management plan asking council to adopt that later on um, in the summer. And then that allows us to finalize our um, internal snow and ice management program. So much like the plan itself, a level of service sets expectations for the community is foundation for resources. As we uh, plan resources ahead, we're currently working on our 2025 and 2026 budget, um, as well as contracts. So that's really able to, we contract out often years in advance and plan for those. So that really helps us to plan um, quite far ahead and it provides very clear direction for our staff. Before we get into some of the details, I did want to focus and highlight that level of service considerations that we are asking you to consider tonight are really for an average storm event. So that's something in Sammamish that we would see maybe over three days, sometimes five, and really um, no more than an accumulation of about a foot um, in total of, of snow precipitation. So this conversation tonight, if we had a storm event that was forecasted to last eight to 10 days, um, that would require completely different conversations and resources and our level of service would likely not apply in those very large storm events. So just as a reminder, while it only snows here a few times over the winter, um, our teams work on snow and ice gear around. So we are kind of in that first area of this slide where it's March through July, we are planning our resources and our budgets for a few years out for snow and ice. Um, we'll get to these later in the, the presentation today, but um, Dan, Dan and our maintenance um, lead just came back from a national snow conference. So um, we are already planning on, on our snow resources for the next few years. Before we get into level of service, um, it's important to just have a quick reminder about the different phases of um, snow response or storm events. <clears throat> Keep in mind that no event is, is the same. Um, and often some of these phases really rely on the weather prior to the storm as well as our road temperatures. Um, what the community sees are phases three and four. So that's when our, our snow fighters are out on the roads and they're plowing um, occasionally maybe community members might see us out um, striping the roads as we're applying pretreatment, but rarely are, um, rarely the community is not as involved in one in five. So like I said, we do plan for the next winter season starting in March for the prior year. As a storm is forecasted about five days before the storm, we really start initiating all of our protocols for snow and ice response. So that begins the kickoff of daily meetings at a minimum. Um, with a lot of our stakeholders. We start to really um, hone in on pavement temperatures um, throughout the city. They can be very different throughout the city. Um, and we do have a meteorologist that works with the city as well. And we have daily conversations with that meteorologist to understand where snow may fall in the city. Because again, that can be very different. <clears throat> And we begin to plan for our, our crews to shift into 24 hours um, response schedule. So we have 12 crews that work 12 hour shifts. So we begin to prep that about five days out for every storm that's forecast. And of course our equipment, all of our plows, trucks and everything, those final checks um, are run through one more time before that first flake starts to fall. Um, about a day before the snow actually falls, Again, we're, we're monitoring weather and road temps this whole time. If it's not raining, we're allowed, we can, um, that typically allows us to apply pretreatment. Um, should it be very cold, there are some conditions that um, some of our pretreatment wouldn't work, but for the most part, if it's dry skies and not too cold, we, we are able to get out there and treat the roads ahead of time, which um, helps to reduce some of the bonding between the precipitation and the pavement. Once we get into phase three and four, this is really talking about our snow removal. 
um, please keep in mind that as we move through our priority routes, if it doesn't stop snowing, we're likely not moving off our priority one and two routes until the snow stops. So we'll get through those routes and their importance in a few slides, um, but these are kind of the key takeaways from that. During this time, we are constantly monitoring our materials, our fleet, our parks, our equipment, um, our crews to make sure that that all is well. Um, like I said, the storm is the same and different things happen um, through every single storm. Once we get to that fourth, fourth phase is really only when our um, first three priority routes are completed. And after that fourth, or I'm sorry, after priority route four is completed, we begin service on all of our other residential routes. So currently we do service every road in Sammamish um, and we'll get into that in a little bit more. The thing I wanted to highlight here um, is our post-storm cleanup or the, the kind of the fifth phase of a storm. In that phase, this can last three, four or five weeks after a storm, depending on the storm. This is the part typically that no one sees. We're out um, cleaning up the down trees that we weren't able to pull off the road. Um, we are clearing storm drains. We're sending our vector contractors out and monitoring um, we are required by our stormwater permit to clean out our storm drains if we apply any sand. And so we're monitoring all of that. Typically as the snow melts, it starts raining. Um, so we are responding to flood response, closing roads, and the list continues. Um, we typically have three or four weeks of pothole repairs if, if the weather holds. Sometimes those very quick fixes um, will actually result in multiple repairs over several weeks as well. It takes a lot of time to go through our in inventory, to um, remove all the plows from the trucks, if that's something we, we can consider. Um, and of course, cleaning our equipment and our, our trucks so that the rust doesn't start on all of those um, trucks and the equipment. And of course, we hold several post-event reviews to see lessons learned and things we can improve on and things we did well. Um, this just showcases some of the coordination that is required for any type of storm response. It's a lot. Um, first of all, kudos to our, our snow fighters, and that is an actual term. Um, they consist of our public works crews, our parks crews, and then all of our superintendents. So the work they do is absolutely phenomenal. And there's a support team that supports them along the way. Almost every department in the city um, has their hand in snow nice response to a degree. Um, we also require daily coordination, sometimes hourly depending on the event um, with our, our partners at Smamish Police. We are coordinating with them all the time, um, 24 hours a day during a storm response, anything from closing a road, um, helping stranded drivers. Um, they help us a lot by towing, co towing, towing cars out of the right of way so the plows can get through. Um, in addition, we are constantly coordinating with Issaquah, Redmond, King County Road Services. I won't go through the list, but it's a lot and we definitely appreciate the the regional support um, during a storm event. The column on the right of your screen often requires um, daily check-ins with a lot of these stakeholders as well. So I just, again, meaning to show all the coordination it takes behind the scenes as we're um, supporting our crews out on the, uh, on the road. Um, we'll get into more of the details in, of level of service in a few slides, but as I mentioned, currently we do plow all of our roads. In Sammamish, we have over 415 lane miles, including 735 cul-de-sacs. We have plows just to plow the cul-de-sacs. Um, so we have a very high level of service. That level of service requires um, 24 snow fighters, 12 working 12 shifts, 12 hour shifts, I'm a mechanic, oftentimes even an on-call mechanic to support. Um, we, we talked through the last slide, there's a lot of support staff and teams and stakeholders involved. And um, we have 13 plow trucks, 15 plows, 10 sanders. There's quite a bit of equipment that goes into storm response and this doesn't even get into our parts um, and different things that is required to upkeep those equipment. Um, our maintenance and operations center is the primary location where we store all of our material and we just acquired our south yard to help with some of our route efficiency and be able to store some um, stone ice material in the south part of the city. Before we get into level of service for Sammamish, thought we would do take a minute to benchmark with some of our neighbors. Um, this was provided 
uh, by Kirkland a few years ago when we were all discussing our a storm uh, response after a certain storm, and we were kind of reaching out to see what other cities um, had in terms of response. So it's really informative. Um, as you can see, other than Bellevue, which has almost tripled the lane miles, um, that's really the only agency that has more plows than Sammamish does. Okay, so some of the 23 and 24 program improvements. Um, we do review our priority routes routinely. This is something that Dan spearheads and works with police and fire um, on to so that we're always taking um, a look at those routes and making changes as needed. Um, we were able to update our map, so thank you to our GIS team. The new map looks great. It's hard to see in this slide. We will add it to our webpage soon. Um, this map was updated both from input from staff as well as the community, so it's it's a great end result. Um, and just the box down um, at the bottom of your screen, thought it was interesting to take a look at the centerline miles um, for each of the priority routes in the city. Some other improvements we really um, improved a lot of our networking, so we were able to coordinate with Issaquah, Newcastle, and Redmond very often and learned quite a few new things. Um, like I said, Dan and Bud just attended the American Public Works Association or APWA Snow Conference a few weeks ago, so there's just some photos from the event. We were able to partner with City of Redmond and send some of our snow fighters to um, simulator training with Redmond this last year. And of course, we were able to acquire the South Yard. The photos in the top of your slide showcase the South Yard and some of the material stockpile um, that we're able to have available for um, the south part of the city. As I mentioned, we are always um, interested in improving our program, regardless of level of service. So these are some planned program improvements for the next budget biennium. Um, this next winter, we are hoping to try out a sander motor conversion to electric uh, motor. Currently, they are um, gas powered, so we are excited to try out an electric motor. This was a recommendation brought to us uh, by Newcastle, so thank you for Newcastle for sharing that with us. Um, and if, if that pilot program goes well, of course, we'll be working with um, our, our fleet and parks and facilities to look at um, a longer conversion for all of our motors for the back of the Sanders. We're also evaluating um, snow and ice route mapping and efficiency software right now. Currently, we don't have anything that tracks the amount of materials used on different priority routes. So that's something that we're really excited to, um, to, to be able to look at in the future so we can showcase to see how much um, road salt, for example, was, was applied on priority route one um, throughout a storm event. And we're always looking at different equipment. So showcase down here, some icebreakers, um, some different types of equipment that could go on the front of a plow that can deal with different types of storm. Um, and then some different blades that, that we could consider in the future that would not um, remove our raised pavement markers so have some budget savings there. Okay, wanted, before we get into level of service, I just wanted to provide you a quick summary of the cost baseline for some of our level of service cons considerations. So um, we'll go through right now, and we have three options for your consideration. Option three is what we currently provide, and that's every single road in the city is, is plowed and treated during a storm event. Um, option one, um, we would just be looking at providing service for the first Prior, first four priority routes, and then option two is our staff recommendation, and we'll get into those details a little bit more. Um, the table above shows our average cost per day. So just what you can kind of see, there are some, some variances there, but where it really starts to vary is when we look at those costs spread out over a three-day storm, which we see a lot of, as well as a five-day storm, and of course, as we roll the, all those costs up into what we assume, um, well, the types of storms that we'll see in a given two-year window are typically about two three-day storms and two five-day storms. So it's quite a bit of difference between option one, two, and three. This slide will be at the end as well, so we won't go through it in full detail, but it, again, it showcases the cost that we just went through at the bottom, um, as well as the amount of forecasted 
quantities of materials that we'd be applying. That includes road salt as well as liquid de-icer. Um, so that's based in, in tons, I believe. And that's based on the 2022 through 2023 storm season. We consider that an average storm season here in Sammamish. Um, the main differences between the different options is we now work from the top down. Um, every single option will be applying pretreatment as needed and based on staff expertise throughout the city um, if we are able to based on road and weather conditions. Um, all the options we'll be seeking to improve our program as we just discussed. All three or all four of our priority routes would be provided in, in every option. And that's where the similarities stop. So option one, um, um, we won't be providing service to all, any of our residential roads. Option two, we would plow our residential streets and I have some slides that will showcase what this would look like. And we would not provide service to our cul-de-sacs. And option three is what we currently provide. I'll move a little bit quicker through these since you've seen a lot of the information in terms of the, the table itself, but just if you could focus on the photos here. So the photos outlined in green on the upper right um, is what our roads look like for our priority routes. Please keep in mind, they are serviced to good driving conditions, um, something that we can't compare to roads in the spring and summer, for example. Um, often, as we are able to, we can service curb to curb for our priority routes, again, with the focus of, of serving the greatest amount of people um, and keeping the lifeline priorities for police and fire to get through. With option one, as discussed uh, before, the residential streets would not be serviced for our very our average storms. So those are three, three-ish day storms where it's likely to melt um, right away as well. So the roads would look similar to the photos down below. Option two, again, all of our priority routes would be service, so the roads would look similar to the photo in the green. In this option, we are proposing to plow only on our residential streets, so by that we, mean we wouldn't treat any of our residential streets. So um, it, it's good, good winter driving condition, um, just we wouldn't be applying um, liquid de-ice or road salt as we're going through and plowing the roads. We'd be saving quite a bit on on time and materials for this option. Option three, um, like I said, current level of service. The above photo showcases one priority routes one through four. The photo down below um, represents good winter driving conditions, particularly for a residential road. Um, it's never rarely curb to curb. We try to get as, as close as we can currently, but it utilizes a lot of staff time um, and a lot of material. Staff recommends option two, and we'll go through those in a little bit more detail in just a moment. Option two is much more sustainable for the city. It provides public safety by focusing on priority lifeline routes first, and then considering plowing only on residential streets while not servicing cul-de-sacs. Again, these are for some of those shorter storms. <clears throat> it allows us to optimize staff resources um, staff can resume to scheduled work orders sooner. So part of the cost of these services is only for our snow and ice response. The staff time or the cost down at the bottom of your screen does not include our vector services, our street sweeping or any of those costs. Um, right now, our crews are assigned to snow and ice response or cleanup for weeks after a storm. And we are often don't get to a lot of the items or work orders on our list that we, we could um, a lot sooner with this option. Option two reduces impact on the environment. So there is quite a bit of reduction in materials um, utilized and um, we would anticipate a reduction in vehicle miles traveled as well. Um, it would also reduce the cost of operations significantly by um, again, reducing the materials used, the wear and tear on vehicles, and of course the staff time um, for a 24 hour response and option two aligns with our climate action plan. We do have a prepared motion ready for you, um, but first wanted to go through a few of our next steps as I highlighted at the beginning of the presentation and we are hoping to have you select a level of service today. We'll be back in June or July with our, our draft management plan for your review um, and adoption hopefully in July. And then 
um, over the, the later summer months, we'll finalize our implementation guide. It's a staff resource for us. Um, and then in the fall, of course, we'll begin our winter storm preparation and season communications. I do have a draft motion, but I'm assuming there are questions. So back to you, Mayor, and we're happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you so much, uh, Council. Uh, Council Member O'Farrell. Thank you, Audrey. Um, can you just help me better understand the difference between option two and three in terms of what option two doesn't give us uh, in terms of what the road conditions would look like and what, what roads we're not going to service and what condition they're going to be left in. I'd really like to understand that better. Of course. Um, so option two, we will still be servicing a majority of our residential streets after, of course, priority routes one through four are fully completed. Um, the difference between two and three is that we are not applying um, treatment to our residential streets. So they would look... Um, a little bit like the, the photo in the bottom of your, your slide, that is quite a bit of snow accumulation, so, um, but it would, they would look similar to that. So they would still be in good driving condition. Um, it's what a lot of the region um, um, carries out for their snow and ice plans. Mm -hmm. um, we just wouldn't be spending a lot of time and, and resources applying treatment to residential roads, particularly um, during storm events that the accumulation typically melts in about three to five days. And when you say residential streets, can you define what that what that is? You said, like for example, we wouldn't be going into cul-de-sacs, um, but right. you know, so many of our residents. That's always the hardest part here is that you're stuck in your neighborhood and you're not able to get out. Um, so would that mean? Are we talking with the streets inside the neighborhood, even though the public streets they would not be plowed or treated, or just that they would not be treated, but they would be plowed? They would be plowed as resources allow, just not treated, and we would not be um, we would not be clearing cul-de-sacs at all. So, cul-de-sacs would not receive treatment at all with with option two. Would not be plowed um, the reason at all. for that is particularly they're they're usually serving just a handful of homes, and they do require a lot of resources. We have plow attachments just for cul-de-sacs, um, mm -hmm. so it, it does consume quite a bit of resources. It's always a challenge to move snow around the cul-de-sacs as well, so they are they are really hard to take up a lot of time. And one last question, Audrey. When you say not treated, does that mean they're not treated means they're not being sprayed with de-icer or that type of thing? Um, treated means, and Dan, jump in here, please. You're the expert. But um, treated would mean that we wouldn't be applying um, our road salt to help break down, the, to help facilitate the, the ice um, being melted a little bit sooner. Okay. And it helps to kind of um, um, dissolve the bond between the precipitation and the pavement. Okay. So we'd still plow the road, um, so snow would be removed from the road, depending on the storm as best as it could be. Um, we just aren't, aren't spending material and time to treat the residential streets. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Deputy Mayor Howe. Thank you. And Audrey, I'm in favor of your recommendation at this point. To me, it's a sensible compromise. I have my question. I have a couple of different questions. Um, first of all, when a city makes a mistake and has a policy that doesn't work, um, wouldn't you just address it the next year? Like if we screwed up and climate change has, you know, progressed in a way that we didn't understand, wouldn't okay? You, it wouldn't we just see how level two went? And if it didn't work out so great, we would adjust it. We just have to budget for it. I think there's always um, opportunity to, to relook at something if, if it turns out that it wasn't working for the community. So we are looking for the level of service to be folded into our our plan, our policy. Those are typically two to three pages long that right. would accompany a city council agenda bill. And these are the types of plans that can actually flex to some extent at a later date if they absolutely have to. And so I look at this as sort of a a test or a trial to, to see can we can we can we get away with <laughs> option number two? I, I do think it would be still delivering substantive benefit to residents. Um, I was curious too with the uh, 
co snow conference that was attended. Is there anything new on the horizon besides CCP and rock salt that is less damaging to the environment, less damaging to animals? Anything better out there on the horizon? Or are we still looking at the same old, same old? Yeah, nothing new out there. It's still rock Great. salt or um, CCB or something like it. Okay. And um, a different question again. I, you, there was one slide that talked about planned program updates, and you were talking about getting a particular type of snow plow that didn't actually damage the, um, the reflectors and so forth that we put onto the ropes. First of all, thank you. Thank you for that part. Um, and is that a plan that's in the budget or it's one you hope to put in the budget? We are hoping to put that in the budget for consideration. So um, part of the, the wonderful opportunity that staff had to go to the conference was to learn about a lot of these different um, um, types of equipment and to see what's out there to talk with other agencies. And so this was a great find. Um, we're really excited and I think that would offset some of the costs for reinstalling those RPMs um, as we move, move through the, the spring and summer months. So um, we're excited to try it out. I am assuming that if it is asked for in the budget, it would probably be um, a trial basis similar to our, our conversion for our sander motors, right? We might try one or two to see how they work. Okay, thank you very much. Councilmember Lamb. So I also support staff's recommendation of option two. Um, I did have one question regarding material storage compared to um, our next, compared to our neighboring city, Redmond, which is the closest in terms of population and lane miles. We store a lot of materials, uh, both de-icer and road, road salt, and it's like double or, or triple, it seems. Would we purchase less? And is there a reason we purchase so much more than Redmond? Do we just like to be prepared? Um, I can start and then Dan, please jump in. But my understanding is part of it's twofold. Part of that is based on the level of service that we have. Um, and so because currently we are providing that service to every road in Sammamish for every type of storm event, and um, we need to have that much on, on hand for our stockpile. Um, my Understanding is also in, in prior years that um, a lot of times we weren't able to receive supplies quite as easily as perhaps our counterparts in Bellevue. And so part of that was just where we're located. Okay. Um, but to answer your question, I would just, we would keep all of the supplies on hand, of course, that we have, um, and this would just help us forecast for what we would need to reorder um, um, for next year's, uh, the next few years, actually, um, snow season. Okay, great, thank you. All right, council, anyone else? Awesome, does anyone want to make a motion? I'll move. Yep. I move to adopt option two as presented as the level of service for snow and ice management in Sammamish. Second. All right, moved and seconded. Any questions or would you like to speak to that at all? Dr. Uh, very quickly, just that we have discussed this uh, before, so this is, so I feel well grounded in the material. And I think we've had time to really think about what this really means. And I think you've delivered a really good option for us that serves every, everyone's, everyone well. Great, thank you. All right, um, all those in favor of the option two say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. All right, so we are at a four two, um, but that passes. So, and I believe it was Councilmember O'Farrell and Councilmember Treen. If you guys got that, cool. Um, all right, well thank you everybody. I think it would be probably most fun to have a Dan Johnson snow conference PowerPoint next. <laughs> um, thank you for your research on all of this and looking forward to seeing next steps. So thank you all. Thank you, Mayor, thank you, Council. All right, so next up, or last up, we have our public comment. So we'll start here in the room, and then if anyone signed up today, we'll move online. Oh, okay, awesome. Great, thank you. All right, Mark?
208th Avenue Northeast in Sammamish. I, I wanted to just personally uh, thank uh, both the council and the staff and public works who are uh, moving forward with the funding and then the design and the construction of the uh, tight line project on Thompson Road. Um, I can uh, tell you that uh, during one epic snow event that a person had been to the Tacoma boat show and stopped at a friend's house uh, during the snowstorm here in Sammamish and then both his car, the boat and the new trailer were all in the side of the ditch on Thompson Road. So um, it, what you're doing with that sidewalk is gonna keep a lot of cars on the road and, uh, and not have to have emergency services. Uh, the thing I brought to you tonight is just a one-page sheet from uh, the Kokanee Restoration Program, and they're talking about restoration and enhancement of Lake Sammamish Kokanee tributaries. And I wanted to link that to what Public Works was talking about with uh, coming up is a, a restoration plan for uh, stormwater facilities. And to me, stormwater facilities include um, detention ponds that were designed many decades ago and um, that uh, potentially are underutilized. And it will be inexpensive for us to take existing ponds that you already own, you already operate, and simply put a flow meter on them so that you can see how they react during storm events. And it's possible that some, like the one at Lancaster Ridge, um, was designed uh, bigger than it needed to be uh, and has an outlet that's bigger than it should be. And so it does not help take the top off of those storms. And in the coffee uh, that um, was organized by the Kokanee uh, work group with uh, Wally Pereira and Jim Bauer, who's a scientist, uh, they're still looking for detention in Ebright uh, uh, Basin. and. Um, that ridge project, Lancaster Ridge, could be a place where you would actually just put a smaller outlet on it, and then it would come up and hold more water over the top of the flood. But the really, uh, you've talked about technology tonight changing, and maybe we're gonna go more electric and such. One of the places that really hasn't changed much since I entered the urban planning field, uh, my first professional job was with the city of Sausalito, California. And, and the one person that had a, per, a permanent job was the public works director because they were the only one that knew where all the storm drain and sewer pipes were in town. There was no map. So uh, from that to today, we still have not done anything with our detention ponds to say, gee, there, we, we've been told there's a 100-year storm event coming. Maybe we could drain them out and be ready to retain water. Um, so I think there's a lot of things, opportunities here to work on that. And I think that the Thank restoration you. plan that you're gonna work on with Public Works is a place where we can get more use out of our stream drainage facilities. Thank you. Thank you. Mary? Good evening, my name is Maria Wichter. I've lived in Sammamish since 2000. And I'm sure when I moved here, there wasn't even a pickup with a snow blade on it. And I think in about 2016, a snow, and a brand new snow plow was brought here to a city council meeting. And I remember Glenna Krumhoff was there. And they're like, hey, we have a brand new snow plow. So we have a lot of them now and I'm really grateful for the work that they do. Um, just a couple things from your whole meeting tonight. Um, on funding under the TIP stuff, um, it says REITs, which is real estate excise tax. Long ago in 2016 when I researched fees and how we could get more money for stormwater, there were two REITs. There's a REIT 1 and a REIT 2, and I thought that the city only collected one and never did the second one, and it only used to go to stormwater and to parks. So you might check on that because if it's all going to transportation or maybe there's something else we can collect because that's when people sell a house, you get that money. Um, also on lights, um, I think it's important to have lights, but I also think if we're gonna do wildlife corridors and other things, you have to watch the amount of light and where it is and do we really need to have it on at 3 a.m. when people aren't driving in there all the time. I think going toward um, LEDs is a really good idea and I understand the technical complications with that. 
There's also dark sky ones where you aren't emitting like the type of light, whether it's mercury or other vapor lamps. So I would suggest if we're trying to be more friendly to the environment and the wildlife corridors, particularly if those are drawn out, we'd use lights differently there. Um, I think it's a good idea to not do all the roads. Um, and I think your option two is a good settle on that. Um, I know when we were first looking at Lewis Thompson years ago when Steve Slinaszewski was the public works director, we said, hey, you've got the salmon stream we're trying to save and you're putting these pollutants in. Is there any way to not do that? And I'll ask that again because we're redesigning Lewis Thompson as we're thankful for. Um, and you're gonna be putting water quality treatment, some things under this, and if there's sand or if those pollutants are going in there, how is that interacting? Maybe that's a dumb, naive question, but I think it's worth asking. Um, I think that cul-de-sacs, what we do on 208th when the city plows to us and we go back as we all get out and we do our sh snow shovels together, those people who buy snow shovels, buy them this time of year, um, and then you kind of get a community thing going and then you work from home or you just don't go in those days if you um, can avoid it for one to three days. Um, other than that, I think what Mark Cross talked about with the, there's a lot of existing stormwater ponds. It was 300, 400, I think it's over 500 now. I don't believe they've ever been mapped, but they're important for wildlife corridors and other things because you can't, the wildlife are gonna walk between them. People might be able to walk between them. You could do native plants and you might be able to get some storage. And I learned from septics, if you have up to a thousand points and you have them in the right format, you can map them on King County IMAP, like if, if you're a person that you can do that. So if we have those, maybe we could get an instant map of those and see where they are. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, um, do we have anyone that signed up for online? Okay, um, per the new reasonable accommodation, those who had pre-registered by three o'clock today, please raise your hand if you wish to give testimony. I see no commenters, Mayor, thank you. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Scott. Thank you, Mayor. I just have a few items for this evening. Um, I want to <clears throat> kick it off by reminding Council next week we are an early start. We have our joint um, meeting with the Issaquah School District Board, and so that'll be here in City Hall Chambers with a 5.30 start time. So just, uh, I know it caught me by surprise, May is moving along quite quickly. Um, I also wanted to remind this Wednesday the Farmer's Market kicks off, and we are very excited to have uh, the farmer's market start up this year and it looks to be nice weather for day one of the market. So um, please come join us on Wednesday from four to eight. Um, the next item is a reminder, uh, there is a groundbreaking at Town Center this Saturday morning at 10 a.m. Um, it is the, the lot right next to the entrance to the Lower Commons Park and you'll see directions where to park if you come down there. So please come on and join us. Council members, uh, if you come here to City Hall, we will have um, a staff person that can ferry you over to the event so that we don't, we try to reduce the number of cars that are there since it is limited parking. Um, I also wanted to say a big thank you to everyone that came out for Rigapalooza on Saturday. It was a well attended event. Thank you, Councilmember O'Farrell and Councilmember Stewart for joining the team. And I am told that the highlight was um, one of our staff, Clinton, getting in the bucket loader and dropping the parachutes for the kids. Uh, it's quite the event, and it takes it. Uh, uh, going up in the bucket loader is no. Uh, you gotta you gotta enjoy heights to want to do it. So a big thank you to all the team that was out there helping. We got some great Silver Jubilee videos. People coming in giving their um, their memories of Sammamish, and so um, we encourage folks to come out and continue to join us at our events uh, and help with that video montage for our 25th anniversary. One other item to note for council, and I'm very excited to announce that we have a new finance director starting this week. Her name is Vicki Carlson. Um, she will be getting her feet wet and uh, we'll be introducing her, showing her where the office is this week, but um, as soon as we can, we'll get her introduced to council. Uh, and we're very excited to have her on board as we start to head into budget season. So um, positive note to end my city manager report with that, Mayor, back to you. Great, thank you. Does anyone else have anything to add? Councilmember Lamb? I have a Board of Health meeting on Thursday and a Solid Waste Committee meeting on Friday, and I'll get the agenda out. Deputy Mayor Howe? Uh, 
I have a RTC meeting on Wednesday, so I'll send the agenda out for that. All right, anybody else? All right, we are free. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night.